officer charged. The Brooklyn Center officer seen pulling and shooting a firearm in this body cam video is now in police custody. The Washington County Attorney's Office announced the charges on Wednesday. That jurisdiction is leading the prosecution to avoid a conflict of interest. Kim Potter is charged with second degree manslaughter, a charge, charge that carries a maximum penalty of up to 10 years in prison. Potter has been a Brooklyn Center police officer for 26 years. She resigned on Tuesday. On Sunday, when the shooting occurred, she happened to be training in another officer. Potter yelled taser several times when she apparently mistakenly used her firearm. Outside the Brooklyn Center Police Station, a call for legislation. So I'm asking this, this whole body to take a bold move and end all budget negotiations until they say Black Lives Matter That's here in right. this state. Protesters demanded action on a police accountability bill. They're calling on the governor, the Senate Majority Leader, and House Speaker Melissa Hortman of Brooklyn Park to suspend all policy and budget negotiations until such legislation is adopted. Cedric Frazier of New Hope and Samantha Vang of Brooklyn Center are among the House lawmakers calling for several police reform priorities. They include banning the alteration and withholding of police body cam footage, prohibiting police officers from affiliating with white supremacist groups, and allowing local governments to create civilian oversight councils. Each provision is in a larger public safety omnibus bill that gets a hearing on Thursday. On Wednesday, a call for healing outside the Brooklyn Center Police Department. This plea came from local pastors. Here's Delane Cleveland. It's one of the world's most familiar hymns. Sung on a street that's drawn the world's attention. We want to extend that grace because we all have made errors mistakes, even intentionally done wrong, and we need grace uh, to help us pass these challenging times. All, your mistakes. All week, demonstrators and police have clashed along Humboldt Avenue in Brooklyn Center. Father, if we are truly brothers, yes. help our other brothers yes. to understand yes. the pain that we feel. But for a brief moment Wednesday afternoon, anger and hurt was replaced by hope. And so much has been released, anger and hurt and anguish. We can't just leave that out there by itself. We wanted to also add prayer. Pastors from eight different Brooklyn Center congregations gathered outside police headquarters on Wednesday. Lord, we're suffering, we're in pain. We pray for comfort. We pray, Lord God, that this situation would not disunite our community, but it will unite us. The pastors gathered here know that prayer won't bring back Dante Wright. But I don't believe by any means that it was a, a vicious intent. Her life is altered, but his life is gone forever. His family is impacted forever. Nor will prayer solve the problems that led to Wright's death. But they hold out hope that a higher power can be a guide for those with the ability to bring about change. Praise God. In Brooklyn Center, Delane Cleveland, CCX News. Meanwhile, residents who live near the Brooklyn Center Police Station have found themselves caught up in the crosshairs of protests and civil unrest. Reporter Pafu Yang spoke to some people who live near the police station. As a fourth night of protesting unfolds, tenants living across the Brooklyn Center Police Department says they plan on relocating to hotels for safety. A resident we spoke to explains what it's like to live in a war zone. It's barely almost coming up on a year that has happened to, you know, George Floyd, and then now here we are again. Angela Johnson has lived across the Brooklyn Center precinct for three years. When the tragic killing of Dante Wright happened, her backyard became the focal point. The bombs going off, the fireworks, all the people yelling, screaming. Um, it causes people high anxiety. Johnson says the violence only comes out during the night, saying protesters are mainly peaceful. People are bringing food, water. The community is like coming together. It's really amazing to see, like I love seeing it. Johnson says it's not until the police start shooting people with rubber bullets and flashbangs that protesters break out into disorder. When they aim, it just goes anywhere. You know, it's like hitting the building, hitting people's cars, hitting people. But public safety officials say not all groups Groups proved to be peaceful. Police have been hit with blocks, alcohol bottles, and cans. Uh, started with the fireworks, started with lasers being pointed.
it and started with the activities that lead toward a riot. Officials say rioters have even tried to compromise the fence securing the police building. And so as the night unfolded, our teams worked together in coordinated fashion to enforce the dispersal orders that were given and ended up making many arrests, many arrests for riot and other uh, criminal behaviors. Not knowing what to expect for the upcoming nights, tenants living across the precinct plan on getting out of the way. There was a church that came around and offered us hotel rooms yesterday. In Brooklyn Center, Pafuyang, CCX News. In other news, Brooklyn Park voters narrowed down the field of candidates to be the next mayor from 7 to 2. Lisa Jacobson and Hollis Winston grabbed those spots. They will be on the ballot in the August 10th special election to serve the remainder of Jeff Lundy's term. About 5,000 people voted in the primary. Here's how the numbers broke down. Winston received 38% of the vote. Jacobson got 27% and former council member Mark Maida was in third place with 17% of the vote. As we go to break, a community trying to heal. At 63rd and Catherine Drive in Brooklyn Center, where 20-year-old Dante Wright was shot by police, a memorial continues to grow. A large wooden fist now stands at the site. For the past year, the statue stood in Minneapolis, where George Floyd died. Three local teams qualified for the state class 4A boys basketball tournament this season and one walked away with a state championship on Saturday night. A strange but true basketball season came to an end Saturday and it was a storybook ending for the Wyzetta boys. A state championship for the Wyzetta Trojans. The Trojans won the class 4A state title over Creighton Durham Hall, reaching a goal that many teams set but only one can achieve. Since we started the, just the beginning of the season, we knew we were the, one of the top teams to contend in the state. And we always knew that we had the talent and the depth to win a state championship, but we just had to make sure we did it. And we've just continually got better the whole year. And, uh, you know, our defense is something that's really good for us this year. And um, when we're able to lock down teams and, and put pressure on them, it just kind of makes it difficult, difficult for them to score. And that's what we did, and it made us successful this year. In their five postseason games, the Trojans were in sync at both ends of the floor. Our defense was very good in the state tournament. Offensively, we had five guys average double figures in the state in the five playoff games. Uh, we shot 50% from three. When you're that balanced and move the ball that well, it just makes it really tough to guard. It's the second state basketball championship in school history for Wyzetta. First game in 1959. It's a team that the Trojans know all about. I've met those guys seven years ago and met the coaches seven years ago. It's just I talked to the guys all last week about how fun it was to hear their story um, when they talked to me and, and I shared it with the guys and just kind of, they're never going to forget the memories that were created. These guys are going to have forever. That trophy is going to represent that more than it is the actual wins and losses. You know, we kind of talked about them and had them a little bit in the back of our minds and it's like, it's been, it's been a long drought since we've won one and you know, that was our goal and we were able to achieve it. The pandemic limited defense. the number of fans who could watch this team in person. And while that was disappointing, in the end, the Trojans are happy to have excelled in this challenging season. In the end, at least we got to play is the most important part. And the fact that we were able to have some sort of fans was really, was really great to us. And for my whole family to be able to be there with me and share that moment was awesome. The weather isn't always cooperating, but high school baseball teams are hitting the fields for their first game since 2019. Here's Jay Wilcox with a preview of the Osseo Orioles. It's time to play ball. The Osseo baseball team is ready to go after a missed 2020 season when the COVID-19 pandemic was in its early stages here in Minnesota. Uh, yeah, it's, it should be a really um, way more fun this year, considering last year at this time that we got shut down. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, I'll tell you what, it, it, it's great to be outside. Uh, we're kind of pushing the weather issue a little bit today, and we think it's totally worth it to be able to be outside on our own field practicing. It's, it's been over 600 days since we've been together as a program, and to be together outside doing it once again is, is awesome. The Orioles won 14 games in the 2019 season and advanced all the way to the Section 5 4A final round before losing to Moundsview. They do have a couple of key returners from that team and outfielder pitcher Wyatt Doubler and third baseman Matt Holine. 
The guys are shaking off some rust, but starting to gel. I mean, early on, yeah, everybody's pretty rusty, but now we're getting back in the flow, so everybody's looking good. Um, I think early on we were a little rusty, not playing with each other at all for the few months or whatever, maybe in summer that we didn't play with each other. But now we're really picking it up, getting back together, getting in the flow. Forecasting the high school baseball season is always tough, this year more than ever. So definitive goals are a little harder to come by in 2021. I mean, this year, since we didn't get season last year, just make the best out of it, no matter what happens or anything. So that's just my goal. Being, being off the field for so long, it's hard to say that this would be a realistic goal. So, you know, just maximizing our potential would be my goal for this team this year. The Osseo guys are eager to see what kind of a team they'll field this spring. Jay Wilcox, CCX Sports. Osseo hosts Maple Grove in a game you can see live here on CCX1 and online ccxmedia.org.